StatQuest. Hello and welcome to StatQuest. StatQuest is brought to you by the friendly folks at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill in the Genetics Department. Today we're going to be talking about p-hacking and power. We're going to describe a p-value pitfall and how to prevent it. Here's the scenario. It's late at night and the grant is due tomorrow. You finished a batch of experiments. You do the stats, and the p-value is 0.051. Ugh! Ugh deluxe. You have time to run one more replicate. What do you do? Before you answer that question, let's do a little thought experiment. Here's an old favorite, the normal distribution. For the sake of the example, Imagine that this curve represents the weights of an inbred laboratory mouse strain. If we weighed mice, most of the measurements would be in the middle, close to the average. Only a handful would be far from the average. Since these weights are from an inbred mouse strain, one sample shouldn't be very different from another sample. For example, if we weigh three mice and call that sample one, and then we weigh three more mice and call that sample two, and then do a t-test on the two samples, in theory, 95% of the time, the t-test p-value should be greater than 0.05. p-values less than 0.05 are called false positives. In other words, most of the time, we expect the two samples to be close to each other and to overlap. Rarely, we might get something like this, where the two samples are pretty far apart from each other. When this happens, the p-value is less than 0.05, and we conclude that the data were generated from two separate distributions, or, in this case, two different mouse strains. Here we see what the t-test thinks happened. It thinks that the samples came from two separate distributions instead of one distribution. This is how you get a false positive sometimes. I want to focus on the samples that have p-values barely greater than 0.05s. We'll talk about false positives some other time. To do this, I generated 1,000 data sets from a normal distribution, and then I performed t-tests on each data set. Here we see the first 20 p-values. There were 980 more, and we see that I got the occasional false positive. As long as this doesn't happen more than 5% of the time, this is okay. The goal is to have a test that works 95% of the time. For most of science, the cost-benefit ratio of being more stringent doesn't make sense. Here's a histogram that I drew of all 1,000 p-values. And here are the p-values that were less than 0.05. I had 53 of them. 53 divided by 1,000 is 5.3%. Hooray! This means the t-test performs as expected. These p-values are the ones that are close to being significant. These are the 0.0051 p-values, the ones that keep you up late at night, sweating out, thinking, maybe I should do one more replicate. So, just to see what would happen, I added one more random value to data sets with p-values between 0.05 and 0.1. And guess what? 30% of the new t-tests resulted in p-values less than 0.05. In other words, when totally bogus data gave me a close p-value, adding more totally bogus data gave me a significant p-value 30% of the time. That, my friends, is a huge false positive rate. So, the moral of the story is this. Don't just add samples until you get a good p-value. This increases your chances of reporting a false positive. Instead, do a power calculation before you do the experiment to determine how many samples you need to do. Alternatively, if you didn't do it before, use your new data to do it now. Um. What's a power calculation? It's a way to determine how many samples you need in advance of doing an experiment in order to correctly get a small p-value. 
Before we get into the nitty-gritty details of what power is and how to do power calculations, let's get a general sense of the concepts. Here, we have two normal distributions. Imagine this one on the left represents weights of mice on a diet, and the one on the right represents weights of mice not on a diet. It's pretty easy to see the difference between these two groups. With relatively small samples from each group, for example, when n equals 3, there is a high probability that a t-test would correctly give us a small p-value. If the diet wasn't very good, the two distributions might have a lot of overlap. With the same relatively low sample size, n equals 3, there is a lower probability that a t-test will correctly give us a small p-value. Power equals the probability a test will correctly give you a small p-value. In the first example I showed you, where we had two distributions that were clearly separated from each other, we had high power. Even with a small sample size, there was a high probability the t-test would correctly give us a small p-value. The second example I showed you is an example of having low power. It's when the two normal distributions, or whatever the distributions you're working with happen to be, overlap considerably. In this case, a small sample size won't likely give us a small p-value that says these are two separate distributions. Four things affect power. The first thing is the effect size. And we just looked at two examples of effect size. In the first example, we had a large effect size. In the second example, we had a small effect size. The second thing that can affect power is the variation in the data. Here's an example of how variation can affect power. In this specific example, the effect size is relatively small, but so is the variation in the distributions. Because the variation in the distributions is small, there is a high probability that our samples will also have low variation. This means that there is a relatively high probability that we will correctly get a small p-value. Here's a second example of how variation can affect power. The distributions have lots of variation. Because the variation in the distributions is large, there is a high probability that our samples will also have large variation. This means that there is a relatively low probability that we will correctly get a small p-value. When we don't have very much variation in the data, we can have high power even when the effect size is relatively small. On the other hand, lots of variation in the distributions can cause us to have low power. Okay, so now we're back to talking about the four things that affect power. And so far we've talked about effect size, and we've talked about variation in the data. Now let's talk about the sample size. A large sample size can compensate for a small effect size and high variation. To keep things simple, let's assume we're using a t-test. t-tests compare means, and the means are estimated from the samples. Let's take a look at how sample size can affect these estimates. Specifically, let's take a look at how sample size affects our confidence in these estimates. If the sample size was set to 1, then we would only weigh a single mouse to estimate the mean. Here's a sample where we just weighed a single mouse. And with that single measurement, we estimated the mean. If we did the experiment again, we would weigh another mouse and have another estimate for the mean. Most of the time, our estimated means would be in this range. But sometimes, the estimates would be way, way off. To see how much variation there is in the estimates, I plotted a histogram of 1,000 random samples from a normal distribution centered on zero. Note, this histogram looks squished compared to the distribution above because the y-axes have different scales.
because a fair number of estimated means are pretty far from the true mean, it's hard to have a lot of confidence in the estimates. Now let's see what happens when the sample size is set to 2. This time, the mean is estimated by the average of the two samples. Here's where the second sample would estimate the mean. And here's where the third sample would estimate the location of the mean. Notice that the occasional wonky point doesn't pull the estimated mean too far away from the true mean. Here's the histogram of 1,000 means measured when the sample size is 1. And here's a histogram of 1,000 means when the sample size is 2. We see that more of the estimated means are closer to the true mean. There is a higher probability that the estimated mean is close to the true mean. The higher the probability we have a good estimate, the more confidence we have in it. Here's a histogram of 1,000 means when the sample size is set to 5. As we increase the sample size, more and more of the estimated means are closer to the true mean. Again, the larger the sample size, the higher the probability we have a good estimate. When the effect size is massive, we don't need to have a lot of confidence in the accuracy of the estimated mean in order to correctly detect a difference. Even with a small sample size, we have a high probability of getting a small p-value. Power equals the probability you will correctly get a small p-value. When the effect size is small, we need to have a lot of confidence in the accuracy of the estimated mean in order to correctly detect a difference. Here are histograms of means calculated with a sample size set to 3 from these two distributions that are overlapping considerably. Since there's so much overlap, the t-test will probably give us a large p-value. Now I've set the sample size to 8, that is to say, I'm estimating the mean from each distribution using 8 samples. And here we see that there is still a lot of overlap, but we have a greater chance of correctly getting a small p-value. We have more power with n equals 8 than n equals 3. And when n equals 101, we can see that our estimated means create two distinct distributions. With a huge sample size, we have lots of power. A high probability we will correctly get a small p-value. One super important detail the variation in the distributions determines how much power will increase when you increase the sample size. Because the distribution on the left doesn't have much variation, samples will be relatively close to the true mean from the get-go. It will not take a large sample size to get a reliable estimate of the mean. In contrast, the distribution on the right has lots of variation, and samples can be relatively far from the mean. This distribution will require a larger sample size than the other to get a reliable estimate of the mean. So far, we've talked about three of the four things that affect power. The effect size, the variation in the data, and the sample size. The last thing that can affect power is the statistical test that you use. Some tests are more powerful than others. The good news is that while different tests have different power, the t-test, which is very commonly used, is a surprisingly powerful test. Now that we know what power is, let's talk about how to use it to determine what sample size we'll need for an experiment. Here's how to do a power calculation. First, you need some preliminary data or preliminary guesses. You might have some old data laying around, or you might have some publicly available data that's very similar to what you want to acquire, or you might just have a good hunch that your experiment might be similar to another one that you've already performed. If you don't have any data, or even a guess, that's okay. There are still things you can do. For now, let's assume we have some preliminary data. We can use that data to estimate means. 
we can also use it to calculate standard deviations. With the means and standard deviations, we can estimate what the distributions look like. In this case, the effect size is small. There is quite a bit of overlap. So we will need a large sample size to get good power. Remember the histograms of means calculated from different sample sizes? We saw that the variation in those histograms decreased as the sample size increased. The variation in the means is called the standard error, and it is easily calculated. Here's the equation for the standard error. It's just the standard deviation divided by the square root of the sample size. We've got the standard deviation from the preliminary data. And here we have the sample size, which is what we're interested in finding out. Because the sample size is in the denominator, that confirms what we can see. The larger the sample size, the smaller the variation. Power calculations boil down to solving for n in the standard error equation. n has to be large enough so that the probability of correctly getting a small p-value is high. Since you're never going to calculate power by hand, and I'll mention software that does this in a bit, I'm not going to focus on the details of how to solve for n. Instead, it is more important to understand the concepts behind the equation. Understanding the concepts will also help when you don't have existing data or a good hunch. Here are the main concepts for power calculations. Effect size, variation in the data, and sample size. To do a power calculation, we need two of these three variables. If we have preliminary data and can estimate the effect size and the variation, you can calculate n. If you do not have preliminary data, you can start by assuming you will do three replicates. Then you can assume that you are looking for a two-fold difference. Then you will see how much variation will still give you good power. If the variation is unrealistically small, increase your sample size or increase the effect size. If you are doing RNA-seq, the biological variation has already been worked out for human data and inbred laboratory species. So for this particular experiment, you can just plug in the known variation. Then, you either plug in an effect size you want to detect and then determine the sample size, or you plug in a sample size and determine the effect size. Like I said before, you should never have to do a power calculation by hand. There are nice websites and programs that will calculate n, or the effect size, or variation, for you. Back to our scenario. It's late at night, and the grant is due tomorrow. You finished a batch of experiments. You do the stats, and the p-value is 0.051. Ugh! Ugh deluxe. You have time to run one more replicate. What do you do? The answer to this question is, use your results as preliminary data and do a proper power calculation. Instead of writing about a p-value, say that the p-value is suggestive and that your power calculation gives you the sample size for the next experiment. And that's the end of our exciting stat quest. Tune in next time for a super duper exciting stat quest on false discovery rates and p-values and how they're related and what they mean. It's going to be cool, so check it out.